In the Bible, Paul says, continue to work on your salvation with fear and trembling. What does he mean? Is salvation something you work for? Is salvation something you can obtain or you can gain? What is Paul saying in Philippians 2 verse 12? In this video, we will explore the different dimensions of salvation. So stay tuned. So in Philippians 2 12, Paul says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my absence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Paul here, he's talking to the church in Philippi. But what is he telling them to do? Work on your salvation. The Bible tells us that salvation is given by grace through faith. If you believe that Jesus died for you on the cross, you are saved. But that's only the first dimension of salvation. But first, before we go into the different dimensions of salvation, let's look at scriptures that back up the fact that there are different types of salvation. Let's go to the scripture 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 2 says, Like newborn babies crave spiritual milk so that you may grow up in your salvation. That's interesting. So you can grow up in your salvation? The answer to this is clearly yes, because Peter tells us we can grow up in our salvation. So you're saved by faith through grace once, but the dimensions of salvation you grow into, you go deeper and deeper into the realms of, that, of salvation. And in this video, we will look at the different realms of salvation. But let's look at another scripture. Hebrews 7 verse 25. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. So the scripture says he is able to save completely. So there is complete saving, salvation in its deepest dimension. You see a lot of people who are saved, but they don't exhibit the full nature, character, and power of God is because they are not walking in the deepest dimension of salvation. And we will see what these dimensions are. So what are the different dimensions of salvation? So we're going to look at it and we're going to start from the first one because this is the one that starts everything. Every single thing starts from this one, the salvation of your soul. The salvation of your soul. This is what Jesus died on the cross to do for you. That's the first one. The second one is the salvation of your spirit. Okay. We're going to go into that and see what that means. The third one is the salvation of your life. And the fourth dimension and the final dimension we're going to be talking about in this video is the salvation of others. These are the four dimensions of salvation we're going to be looking at. And hopefully God is going to bless you in this video. Open yourself up to receive and pray quickly. Pause the video and pray that God opens up your understanding. That you may be able to receive the things that are about to be said now. So salvation of the soul. Let's start here. We know that the salvation of the soul occurs when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Not by works, not by anything we do, but when we understand that we are sinners and we are incapable of going to heaven and deserving heaven, guess what happens? We position ourselves in a way, because we understand that we, we can't go to heaven, we are deserving of hell. We position ourselves in a way where we're humbled and ask God to save us. Make Him our salvation, not us. So by believing that Jesus died for us on the cross and took away all of our sins, we are saved. This is not something we've done. It's not because we're good or anything like that. It's purely by the grace of God. By the mercy, by the love, by the grace of God. God loves us so much that even though we were sinners, what did He do? He sent us Jesus. 
so that he can die for us and that he can take our sins upon himself. So when you believe that, you're saved. Jesus took your punishment so that you can go to heaven. You're saved simply. But guess what? What goes to heaven? Your soul. God saved your soul at that point. That day you believe that Jesus died for you on the cross and that you're going to you're going to heaven because of him. What's going to heaven is your soul. So we know that our body is made up of three things, right? The flesh, which is the body, the soul, which is our thoughts, emotions, will, all of these things, and the spirit, which comes from God. So when you die, what happens? Your body, from dust to the king, the dust will go, right? Your soul stands in judgment before the judgment seat of Christ. Your spirit goes back to God. In Ecclesiastes, it says, all spirit goes back to God because our spirit came from God. And then we'll go back to him. I want to talk so much about the soul and how, but that's going off topic and, you know. But the first salvation God gives you is the salvation of your soul. In 1 Peter 1 verse 9, it says, For you have received the end result of your faith. And he says, the salvation of your soul. So you see, the end result of our faith is the salvation of our soul. Don't get me wrong. When we were in sin, our spirits were dead and our spirits were resurrected. They were resurrected, but they weren't saved. Our spirit wasn't saved. And later on, when I see the salvation of our spirit, which is the second dimension of salvation, which I'll be talking about, you'll understand what I'm saying. But right now, Jesus, when he died for you, on the cross, he saved your soul from going to that eternal damnation, which is hell, right? But the thing is, that first dimension of salvation is just the beginning. It's just an entrance to deeper levels of God, deeper dimensions that he is welcoming us to with open arms. In 1 John 10 verse 9, Jesus says, I am the door. If anybody enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. You see, Jesus says, I am the door. By faith, we are saved. By faith, we enter that door. You enter that first dimension of salvation, right? But guess what? That was just the beginning. That was just the door. There's a whole new world full of endless possibilities after that door. And that is what Jesus is welcoming us into. Some of us are standing at that gate. We don't walk in. We just stand at that gate. We're like there and we're not going deep in it. That's where you find Christian babies. You see, people think growing is just a matter of how old you are as a Christian. I was a Christian for 10 years and people are like, amazing no you can be christian a christian for 10 years but be a christian baby still you see aging is effortless you don't need no skill to age you just need to jump to age but growing and maturing that is where intimacy with god comes you see anybody can age but not anybody can grow but not anybody can mature. These are the mysteries of God. You see, some people, their whole lives, they'll never go past milk in their Christian journey. They'll never mature to be a son and a daughter of God. They're just children. There's a difference, by the way, between children of God and sons and daughters of God. One is mature, one is just a child which we will look at more as we continue to the second dimension. But this is the danger in our Christian journey, remaining a baby. And that's why the second dimension of God, people transition from the first dimension to the second dimension, from the salvation of your soul to the salvation of your spirit. What is God saving your spirit from? He's saving your soul from damnation, from hell. What is God saving your spirit from? 
Because earlier I said your spirit goes back to God. That's what it says in Ecclesiastes. So what is God saving you from? He's saving you from idleness. Idleness. You see, when we're saved, when we're born again, when God saves our soul, He resurrects our spirit. But some people, even though they have a resurrected spirit, they have a dormant spirit. Their spirit is asleep. They're spiritually sleeping, even though they're not spiritually dead. They're spiritually sleeping. They can't perceive anything of the spirit. And these people are called carnal Christians. Carnal Christians. You see, in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13 to 16, and even the beginning of 1 Corinthians 4, Paul teaches us about three types of men. Three types of men. The natural man, the carnal man, and the spiritual man. We will go and unpack what these three men are because these men are essential to understand the second dimension of salvation. It says, These things we all speak, not in words which men, which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. So you guys hear, the natural man, the natural man, that's the first man. And how is the natural man characterized? But the natural man, on line 14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolish to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So the natural man doesn't know anything about spiritual reality, anything about even the Spirit of God. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct them? But we have the mind of Christ. So here, Paul teaches us about the natural man, who does not perceive the Spirit of God, nor knows anything of it. But let's go to 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1 to 3. And I, brethren, cannot speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal. So here he shows us there's spiritual people and there is carnal people. So what's the difference? Let's read. As to babies in Christ. So you see he's saying carnal people are babies in Christ. So you see, uh, being a carnal person doesn't mean you're not a believer. Believers are carnal people. Believers are carnal Christians. Because they are babies in Christ, meaning they are not with the Spirit. Line 2. I feed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you still, you are still not able. So you see, carnal Christians cannot receive deep revelations of God. Carnal Christians cannot think of God outside of their framework, outside of the box they have drawn for Him. The most dangerous thing in our faith is being a carnal Christian. Being a carnal Christian. You are at that state of a spiritual baby, of a baby in Christ, for the rest of your spiritual journey. It's so scary. And if you feel like you're at that one spot and you haven't been growing, progressing, and by the way, growing, i when I say growing, I'm saying Christianity is an experience. Christianity is an experience. It's not just a book that you read every day. There's a point where the Bible starts to resemble your life. And if you can't see that in your life yet, you have to start asking, am I carnal? 
Am I not able to perceive the things of God? And if that's the case, the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. Taking a leap of faith and getting it wrong because we walk by faith, not by sight. Faith means doing it, even though there's a chance of you looking like a fool to anybody. You see, Abraham was told to sacrifice his son. If God told anybody today this, they would be like, this is not God, this is the devil. It's not God. But he had faith. How can you expect to be a servant of God, to serve God? when you're not walking with faith, when you're not walking in these deeper dimensions of salvation. So the carnal believer is the one who's misrepresenting Christ. Why? Because they do not perceive the deep revelations of God. So what do they do? They fight what they don't understand. They fight what they don't understand. Just like the Pharisees fought Jesus when he came. They didn't understand them, they fight. They didn't seek God for, for information. They didn't seek uh, God and said, God, what, what do you say about this? No. They went with their own opinion and they fight. Some of you think because you know doctrines, because you memorize uh, people's sermons, doctrines, uh, you know your uh, Greek, you know your Hebrew. Yeah, that's not deep. That's deep dimensions of those things of Greek and philosophy, the theolo theology, all of that. But do you know the deep dimensions of God? Those are deep dimensions of men that you're studying. Do you know the Holy Spirit? You see, God created us in His image. What does that mean? What does that mean? Does that mean I look like God? No, no. Go back to Genesis. Read what God did. He made humans from dirt. So does God look like dirt? No. What did he? What was actually inside of man that was inside of God? He breathed inside of them. That was our spirit. That's the spirit, you see? And if we're trying to look like God, then we have to do it within our spirit, not in the flesh. Neglect of your spirit, man and neglect of the spiritual reality around you is detrimental to your growth and relationship with God. The second dimension of salvation is God saves your spirit from you. He saves you from this physical reality. He takes you into the spiritual world and shows you his angels, shows you these things, shows you the spiritual realities around you. He activates your spirit, man. So you do not walk on this plane of existence alone, but also on the spiritual plane. Does that make sense? I hope you're catching this. Why? Why is this so necessary to be in the spirit? Because God is spirit. God is spirit. Even Paul says, I serve God in spirit. So to truly serve God, you need to be one, not only with this, but with your spirit. You and your spirit have to be one. The Bible says the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, and our spirit is one. So you see, when even God communicates to us, he speaks to us through our spirit. Of course, he speaks to us through dreams, visions, all of these things. You know, even dreams, he's speaking to you through your spirit, which is sending it to your soul. But we are spiritual beings and you walk in your true calling and your true purpose when you tap into that spiritual part of you. And I'm not saying spirituality. No, 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 no. They understand we're spirits, but they're connecting with wrong spirits. They're not acknowledging the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, which is within us and empowers us to do good, to walk holy and righteous. In John 4, God says this, my true worshipers worship me in truth, meaning the word of God, the Bible and 
spirit and these worshippers the father seeks. Isn't that crazy? God is spirit, so no wonder he's saying true worshippers worship me in truth and spirit. And if you haven't been worshipping him in spirit, or also if you've been worshipping him in spirit and not in truth, guess what? You're not a true worshipper of God. You've been worshipping, but you're not a true worshipper of God. Because this spiritual dimension has to be tapped into to please and serve him. So in the Bible, you see many places God calling us his children. But in other places, you see him calling us his sons, his daughters. The earth is groaning, for the, waiting for the awakening of the sons of God. And right before that, it was saying children. Why? What's the difference between sons and daughters of God and children? And again, it's that maturity level. That's what the difference is. You see, children cannot perceive deep things. Children cannot perceive secrets and mysteries. Children are children. You're not given responsibilities. But as you mature in the spirit, as you become a spiritual man, just like we said, children are more resembling the carnal man. Of course, children grow and they need time to, to mature. But if somebody's in that child state for so many years, that's a carnal Christian. You see? But as they're maturing and growing, and you start to see the fruits of God manifesting in their life, God's hand upon their life, the Bible becomes part of their life, then you start seeing that they are becoming sons and daughters of God. They are maturing in their faith. They are manifesting their identity. These are the spiritual men. So, how, what makes the difference between a child and a son? What makes you a son, what makes you a child, right? So, in John 1 verse 12, it says, Yet to all who did not receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You see? Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So you see, what makes you a child of God? Believing in his name, believing that Jesus died for you. The first dimension of salvation is what makes you a child of God. What makes you a son and daughter of God? Now we have to go to Romans 8 verse 14. Romans 8 verse 14 says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. You see the distinction over there? So the difference here is that one believes the other believes and is led by the Spirit. You see? Are you led by the Spirit? Of, do you just get up and do whatever you want? Or are you led by Him? Does He lead you in your conversations? Does He lead you in your interactions? Does He lead you in your decisions? Because if that's not how you live your life, I'm sorry to say, but you are not yet a son or a daughter of God. But it's not all bad news because there's grace. You see, how can we go deeper into the second dimension, which is the salvation of your soul? How can you go deeper in interacting with God, with His Spirit, and you also interacting with the spiritual plane around you? Number one, understanding that everything is by grace. No great women or man of God came to the place that they are by their own strength, by their own dedication, discipline, hard work. No, that's a lie. That's a lie. And if I tell you otherwise, I'll be lying. Everything is simply by the grace of God. Nobody deserves to go deeper in any realm, any dimension of salvation. We don't even deserve salvation. But God loves us so much. He gave it to us because he's a gracious God. And God, is, even the throne that he sits on is called the throne of grace. How deep is his grace? I, I don't think we even comprehend this. God continuously wants to give to you. Continuously. Every opportunity. God is looking for a way to give you something or to bless you. 
But we don't even understand that. In the book of Zechariah, there was a king named Zerubbabel. This king was a man of God. He came from exile. The temple of God was destroyed. And he made it his job to rebuild the temple of God. But left and right, left and right, there was resistance. Neighboring countries were attacking everything. He couldn't. He was fighting and trying to rebuild, but he would continuously fail. He was trying his best, but he would continuously fail. You see? Isn't that interesting? He's trying to do a righteous thing. He's trying to do something for God. You know? He's trying to honor God, but he's continuously failing. Until God sent his prophet, Zechariah. Zechariah, go and tell Zerubbabel, not by your strength, but by my spirit will you build this temple. Zechariah is symbolic to so many of us. Because we are the temple of God. This is the temple of God. And you're trying to build it. You're trying to build it with discipline. You're trying to build, have a strong relationship with God. But you're failing. Why? Just like Zerubbabel, you were relying on your strength. You were relying on yourself. And let me tell you, God will let you fail a thousand times before he lets you think that you can save yourself before he lets you think that you can do it on your own. Because that's a lie. You can't. And the sooner you understand that you don't even need to do it alone. Nobody ever asked you to do it alone. Nobody, God didn't ask you, be disciplined and do this every morning. He says, come to me, lean on me, give your burdens onto me. That's the things that he's saying to you. But because of the society we live in, you're programmed to think that you're supposed to fight and work for every single thing that you have. But that's not the case with God. He wants to give you more. So stop building this temple on your own. And say, God, I can't do it. I'm weak. I can't do it on my own. I need you. And when you show him that you truly are in need of him, he comes. He comes through. And just like that, the salvation of your spirit, the same thing. The Holy Spirit and your spirit are one now, right? So if you're trying to awaken your spirit, man, feed him and also experience the spiritual reality and serve God through him. Who do you do through? Your discipline, your flesh, or the Holy Spirit who's already one with him? You lean on the Holy Spirit more and He begins to do these things in you and through you. So we will go to the third dimension of salvation. It's God saving your life. Huh. This seems pretty... What? God saved my soul, my life. What's the difference? There's a difference. Okay? There's a difference. When I say your life, I'm talking about your physical life. Your life on this plane of existence, on the physical realm. That's what I'm talking about. Matthew 16, verse 25. Jesus says, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Interesting, right? What is Jesus trying to tell us here? You see, Jesus is showing us the third dimension of salvation, which is the salvation of your life. You see, so many Christians try to save their own lives. When life gets tough, when they, oh, their job gets hard, guess what they do? They stop praying. They stop going to church. They stop reading the Bible. In, in hopes of saving the job, that they have in hopes of saving the relationship with someone that they have they do these things you see they try themselves to save their lives but guess what happens they lose it inevitably inevitably you will lose everything in your life either through death or through other things that happen but god is saying if you lose those things for me, if you lose those things for me, you will save your life. 
What does saving your life mean? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. We all know this verse, right? But the end part is where I want us to focus on. That whoever believes in him may receive eternal life. Wow. Eternal life. You see, the Greek word for that, eternal life, means Zoe. Zoe. And it's so interesting why scholars use that eternal life as a substitute for that word. Because Zoe means something deeper than eternal life. Because at the end of the day, all of us are eternal, right? Like we're all eternal beings. Like if you die, you live for eternity in heaven or you die in hell. I mean, when I say death, you suffer for eternity in hell. So we're all eternal beings. But one day the scholars saw these things that Zoe means life in its fullest. And the way they could capture that or even thought of capturing it was through saying eternal life. But Zoe means something deeper, life in its fullest, the full experience of life. You see, you think you're experiencing life to the fullest or you have, right? Because of the parties or stuff that, that, that we've been to. That's just a distraction from experiencing what life truly is. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. God is the creator of life. God is the creator of all things, right? So who better to make you experience the fullness of what he created than him? But Satan, God is thinking that God is holding back on us. He doesn't want it. He doesn't want us to experience life. What? Why, why would God create life and not want us to experience it? Why would he even put us here in the first place if he didn't want us to experience it? That doesn't make sense. So Zoe, life, is life in its fullest, beyond what you can understand. You see, there might be some clash against what I'm about to say right now, but I don't care. God didn't create you to suffer your whole life. Okay? God didn't create you to be tormented your whole life. And God didn't create you to struggle your whole life. Yes, yes, these are, this is what I'm going to say. Do you see, the Bible is God's love letter to us, right? And in the Bible, there are so many promises of God. Promises that He gives to Abraham, promises that He gives to Israel, promises that He gives to so many people. But do you know that those promises are not only accessible and available to them, they are to you too. Why? In 2 Corinthians 1.20, it says, For no matter how many promises God made, they are yes in Christ. They are yes in Christ. And so through Him, the Amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. You see, God here is saying to us that all of the promises within the Bible to us, His children, his sons and daughters are already a yes. Are already a yes. God is saying yes in heaven. He's saying yes in heaven. But what is holding that yes back from coming and manifesting on earth? And that's the amen that has to be said on our parts, on our behalf. What does Amen even mean? Let it be. God is saying, the blessing that I gave Abraham, I'm giving it to you. But you can stand in agreement and say, yes, God, let it be so in my life. Or you can stand in disagreement. Ah, I don't think so. I don't think what you did for him for me. I don't know, God. I'm not telling you what I think. I'm telling you what the scripture says right now. All the promises of God are yes and amen. If you say it. Did God make give you a promise? Did he come down and give you a promise? Yourself? For some of you, maybe. But for many of you, no. So does this scripture not apply to you? Of course it does. So what is it talking about? The promises from the past. The Bible says, can two walk together unless agreed upon. 
you understand what that means? One person cannot walk with another person unless they both agree to walk with each other. Because if one walks this way and the other could choose to walk the other way, right? Just like that, what God is saying to us is, heaven is saying this about you, that you're going to be uh, an ambassador, that you're going to be a teacher, that you're going to expand the kingdom of God. But do you agree with what is being said? The promises for prosperity, by the way, when I say prosperity, I hope you guys understand there's different dimensions to prosperity and ignorance will destroy you. But there's different dimensions to prosperity. When people hear prosperity, they just think, oh, money, 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 money. That's one of the dimensions and actually one of the least important dimensions of prosperity, the least powerful dimensions of prosperity. Money. There's spiritual prosperity. There's emotional prosperity. Do you get me? There's other dimensions of prosperity that we don't even know and we haven't even tapped into. Many of us. But both spiritual, emotional, physical, meaning wealth, all of these promises of prosperity, which are many in the Bible, are yours. But how do you walk in them? How do you walk in them? And which ones you walk in also depends on your calling, but we're going to talk about them. 1 John 2, 15, it says, Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You see, this is a very interesting scripture. What is John saying when he's saying, do not love the world? The world. That's a very interesting word, right? Because even when they describe Satan, they say he is the ruler of the world, not the earth. Not the earth, the world. God is the ruler of the earth. The Bible says the earth is God's footstool. Don't forget. So what is the world? The Greek word for the word, world is cosmos. And it translates to society, the social structure, the order, the government of the world, the way it's governed, the way it's built. Do not love the world. Do not love these things because Satan is the ruler of the world. He's built these things, these societies, these social structures to take us away from God, right? And if you look at these, oh, I love capitalism. Oh, I love democracy. You're being deceived for these are deceptions implemented by the enemy to take us away from how it ought to be and how it is in the kingdom of God. So God saves your life from the cosmos and from the things of the cosmos, from the world and the things of the world. So many of us struggle to serve God because the, the struggles of the world are heavy, are burdens. But God saves us from these things by putting us in places of power, by putting us in places of elevation, not just so that we can live a lavish life, but also because he wants us to tap into the society and change it and make it more like the kingdom of heaven. And help our brothers and sisters who are around us. These things, are what are supposed to happen. When God saves you from the cosmos, from the systems of Satan, just like he did many of his people. Let's take a look at, for example, Abraham. Look, God prospered him, both spiritually and physically. Look at Joseph, God prospered him. Look at Daniel, do you see? They're living in, in the middle of the cosmos, but God saved them by elevating them. Of course, it's gonna be different for everybody's calling, you see? Some people flow deeper in the dimensions of the salvation of their spirit. And some people flow deeper in the dimensions of the salvation of their life. So God saves your life. And honestly, there is no specific pattern in which uh, what comes before what, the salvation of your spirit or the salvation of your life, you know? 
but always and always the salvation of your soul comes before all things because that is the door which allows you. Everybody's life looks different. Some people you might see the salvation of their life, meaning God changing their life around, you know, making it something that will glorify Him. We don't know it's different for everybody, but we will go to the final dimension of salvation and that's the salvation of others. So in the second dimension, God saving your spirit, we, what did we discuss? We're spirits, right? We are spirits. We're not just flesh. We're not just souls. We're spirit. We're spiritual beings. You see, the Bible tells us that we are new creations in Christ. What does it mean to be a new creation? To be a new creation means that you're something new. Now you are something new, never seen before, created by God. You need to understand these things, that you are a spiritual being unique in every way, that God has created you for a specific unique purpose that only you are able to do. Your calling, is unique. Your gifting is unique. The things that you're able to do, only you can do. But one of the things we're called to do is to save others. You see, we are made in the image of God. We are a reflection of Him. So what are we so what are we even created to do? We're created to reflect Him, to reflect God. You see, the Bible says we slowly become like Jesus, right? Jesus is called the reflection of the glory of God. He's even called the glory of God. The embodiment of the glory of God. So you see, the more we look like Jesus, the more we're reflecting the glory of God all around us. And when you reflect Him, that means you're reflecting love. You're reflecting His love. You're reflecting His mercy, you're reflecting His goodness, all of these things. But what does it mean to reflect God's love? God says this in the Bible, there is no greater love than this for one to sacrifice himself for his friends. So if you're trying to show God's love to people, how do you show? By showing the greatest form of love that he demonstrated for us and that's his sacrifice on the cross the gospel that is the love of god the gospel is the love of god and jesus is the glory of god so when we show people god's glory we're showing them jesus when we're showing people god's love we're showing them jesus simply so you see in this christian faith we're trying to become more and more like Jesus. And in doing so, when we become like Him, which we will, in this life, not even just the next, in this life, you will become like Jesus. If you believe it, it will be yours. You will become like Jesus. But when you become like Him, you see, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45, so it is written, the first Adam, became a living being the last adam became a life-giving spirit hmm. did you catch that <laughs> don't be deceived we said god blew his spirit inside of him adam was a spirit but when he sinned against god he downgraded into a living being jesus was born even though he was god he was born a living being, but by his holiness and the life that he lived, being truthful, blameless, the blameless Lamb of God, he upgraded to what? Being a spirit. But not only that, not only that, he was a life-giving spirit. Everywhere he went, he gave life. People were being saved left and right, left and right, the salvation of others the deepest level of salvation. Being a life-giving spirit. You see, Jesus gave us spirits. He resurrected our spirit. 
in the first dimension of salvation, the salvation of our soul. The day you believe that Jesus died for you, your soul got saved and your spirit got resurrected. But now, and now we're spirits as well. Just like Jesus, we're spirits. Some of us are, more, are walking more in that than others, but our spirit man are all alive, those who believe. Some of, some of them are dormant. Others are thriving, you see. But now what happens when we look more and more like Jesus? We become life-giving spirits. We begin to radiate the life of Christ. You see, at that point, ha, 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 thank you, Jesus. At that point, when you walk, your shadow will heal people. You don't even need to talk anymore. At that point, just like Peter, when he was walking, his shadow was healing people. Paul, tissue that would touch him would go and heal people and cast out demons. You see, these men of God were so deep into the different dimensions of salvation. Guess what happened? They became a life-giving spirits because their life was one with Christ. Do you understand the depth? That is a waiting room. And all of this is possible through Christ and through the Holy Spirit who empowers us. So ask yourself this, I am a spirit, but do I give life? Do I give life? When I meet people, are they meeting Jesus? Are they having an interaction with the Holy Spirit with God? That's not the case. Keep pushing. Go deeper. Rely on him more. John 6, 63 says, The word I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Jesus is saying to people, the words I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Do you see? Words are spirit. You guys don't know this. We don't know this. We haven't been taught these things. But words are spirit. That's why you should be careful of what you listen to on movies and on music. Word, words are spirit, but only his word spirit and life and when you look like him your words begin to become spirit and life that is the final dimension that i'm going to be talking about in this video and are you walking in all four of them ask yourself this and meditate on it let's pray quickly because every time god gives you permission to speak to speak about something there is grace there for you to receive what the person is speaking about in your own life. Father God, Most High God, glory and honor be to you, O Most High. Father God, we thank you, O Jesus. We thank you, Father, for all things that you have done for us, for these deep revelations that you reveal to us, Father. We pray, O Lord my God, that you may guide us, hold our hands and take us into these deep dimensions of salvation, my Lord, my God, that we may no longer be carnal or babies, my Lord, that we may no longer be stuck in one dimension, my Lord, but we may see the manifestation of all four dimensions in our life, my Lord, my God. Father, take us deeper than this. Take us deeper. Most High God, we thank you. We are grateful. We cherish you. There is none like you. You are holy in every single way, my Lord. We are grateful for salvation that you give to us freely, my Lord and my God. And all of these different dimensions that you take us into, three, into freely, my Lord and my God. Father God, everybody under my voice, my Lord and my God, may you begin to mature them. May you begin, Father, to take them on this journey. Father God, to take them on this journey. Father, of growth, maturity, and salvation in every single way, my Lord. That their salvation may be complete, my Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, Father.
Amen.